Okay, let's get started. Um, welcome everybody. My name is Sarah Mendelson. Uh, I am the head of Heinz College in Washington, DC. I'm coming to you from Washington, DC. And I wanna give a warm welcome to all our Carnegie Mellon University students, staff and faculty and to the Georgetown University students, staff and faculty, welcome. I hope this finds you safe and warm wherever you are uh, and healthy. Um, so I, as I said, I'm coming to you from Washington, D.C., where we've been through several months of watching our democracy under tremendous stress, culminating on an assault on the Capitol about six miles away from where I'm speaking to you uh, and attempts to overturn the election results, plays that the U.S. government typically calls as fouls. In fact, let me read from the press release issued by Freedom House that was uh, sent out on January 6th. The violent disruption of a congressional session is unlawful. These are among the most shameful images in our nation's history. We strongly condemn the violence that has occurred in Washington today, which has no place in a democratic system, said Michael J. Abramowitz, who you're gonna hear from in a minute, president of Freedom House. It's an affront to the millions of Americans who peacefully cast ballots, as well as the poll workers who counted them in good faith and the public officials and judges who defended the results against groundless allegations of fraud. In the weeks since election day, innumerable, innumerable citizens have exercised their right to assemble lawfully and express their views without resorting to physical force. It goes on, yet the system we have to say did seem to hold and we have a new administration and we have a new Congress. Uh, but we are clearly seeing many signs of democracy in distress and a rising tide in authoritarianism around the world. Just this week, we have just in the past two days, three days, we have hundreds detained in Russia uh, for peacefully assembling and we have a, a, a coup d'etat in, in Myanmar. Um, this all after year 2020, which we can't forget, when we have experienced and witnessed multiple crises, health, economic, economic, racial, environmental, and yes, political. So we are incredibly fortunate to be joined by a number of experts uh, over the next several weeks to discuss a variety of issues related to this problem set. In today's session, uh, we're gonna be setting the stage in many ways, framing up the big questions and the modalities through which we are seeking to answer these questions. I am joined by good friends, longtime colleagues, uh, and I'm gonna do very short introductions of all of you before turning to our first set of questions. Mm -hmm. Mike Abramowitz, and you can see the Freedom House logo behind him. Mike is president and CEO of Freedom House since 2017. Before that, Mike was at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum uh, where he was part of, I think he had the idea of putting together an exhibit on what Americans knew about the Holocaust. In the last couple of years uh, at Heinz in DC, we have started the academic year with a walk through that exhibit because it's such a great example of both what Americans did know and didn't know, but also interagency battles over <laughs> what people knew and didn't know. Uh, and if you haven't seen the exhibit, I encourage you when the museum is open to, to but Mike has a history as a journalist um, at uh, the Washington Post where he was a White House correspondent. We are also joined by Alex Tier, who is now the CEO and president of the Global Fund to End Modern Slavery, uh, GFEMS, and we're thrilled that he's at that uh, new post uh, and we look forward to working with him on this important issue. Um, Alex has a long history in the democracy peace building uh, field. He's a, he was a, a close colleague at USAID where among other things, he ran assistance in Afghanistan and Pakistan as well as uh, in the policy planning and learning shop there. Uh, and more recently, he was head of uh, a think and do tank in the UK, uh, ODI. And Witkowski uh, is a longtime DC veteran who's worked on the NSC staff in the Clinton administration, on counterterrorism in the Obama administration at the State Department, as well as served as a deputy assistant 
Secretary of Defense at DOD. She is a genius in running process and task forces like the one you're going to hear about today. Uh, so we're very excited that she's with us. She was a longtime colleague with me at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, and we had the bonding experience of going through 9-11 together. Um, so that's, that's who we're joined uh, with today. I want to encourage folks to be sure if you want to ask a question, um, you can uh, put it in the chat function. Everyone is on mute. Uh, you're welcome to have your uh, cameras open if you'd like. Um, but we do ask that you stay on mute unless you're one of our speakers. Um, we will be going through a set of questions that uh, Anne and Alex and Mike have, but there's going to be time for sure to, to go to you. Uh, so when you do ask your question, maybe just give us a little hint of where you're coming from uh, and, then, and then please ask your question. So let's get started. Mike, we're going to start with you, uh, a real scene setter. For those of you who are not steeped in um, the sector, tell us a little bit about Freedom House and what you are known for. And there's a hint to everybody. I don't, there's not a, a um, government meeting, I should say. I served in the Obama administration four years at USAID, where I was the lead on democracy, human rights, and governance. And then uh, at USUN, where I was the US ambassador to the UN's Economic and Social Council. When I was at AID, any interagency meeting that I was in, which was obviously having to do with something democracy, human rights, or governance related around the world, Freedom House's name would always come up. So Mike, over to you first. Thank you, uh, Sarah, for having me. And uh, it's great to be with Carnegie Mellon. It's not the first time I've spoken to Sarah's students. I always enjoy it. Uh, so thank you for inviting me. Uh, so Freedom House, just to give you like a quick word about us, we're probably the oldest, I think, American democracy organization. We actually date back to 1941. And uh, I always start there because I think the founding is so interesting. And uh, we were very involved in fighting the America First movement of that time, which was the uh, kind of the Charles Lindbergh led movement to try to keep America out of World War II. So that's a very proud history. And I think the other thing I would say just about Freedom House, you know, compared to uh, maybe some other human rights groups is that we're very uh, nonpartisan, first of all, but we also try to work across the political aisle as exemplified by our founding co-chairs, our honorary chairs, Eleanor Roosevelt uh, and Wendell Wilkie, who had run against FDR in the 1940 uh, presidential election as a, as a uh, Republican. So the thing we're probably best known for and the thing that Sarah was alluding to is an annual survey we do called Freedom in the World, uh, which is an assessment of the political rights and civil liberties of uh, every country in the world, uh, every territory. And uh, it gets, we've been doing it since 1973. Uh, it's getting, it gets more and more attention, especially with the focus around the uh, democracy recession that's been going on. So anyone who tells you that democracy has declined for 14 consecutive years, they're telling you that because Freedom House has documented that. Uh, we also do advocacy around issues of democracy and human rights. And we also, uh, I think it's probably relevant for this group that we also do work on the ground uh, in, in other countries to support human rights activists and uh, civil society organizations uh, defend democracy uh, in their own countries. And just as one example, we provide uh, a considerable amount of emergency assistance to those defenders in places like Belarus or Hong Kong or Venezuela, et cetera, who find themselves you know, in the crosshairs of the authoritarian governments. Uh, that's kind of a just brief synopsis of Freedom House. Perfect. Um, so we've all come together, you, me, Alex, and as part of a task force. So Mike, let's start with you. What is this task force about? Why a task force? Uh, why the topic? Um, and talk a little bit about the, the, both the timing, but also this nonpartisan nature of it. Given the topic, uh, it is both uh, a challenge and an opportunity, Mike. Sure. Well, I think this is something that has really been on my mind for, I would say really ever since I came to Freedom House, but certainly for the, for the last year and a half or two. And really the question is, you know, what should the US government do to push back against the 
uh, encroachment of authoritarianism, the weakening of democracy around the world. So we have done, and many others as well, we're not alone in Freedom House, I think many have done a good job of kind of documenting and identifying the problem. But I think we at Freedom House felt that more should be done, not just to identify the problem, but also to develop practical and realistic recommendations for the US government uh, to, to address the problem, which is essentially, uh, as I said, rising authoritarianism and declining democracy. And so the idea was sort of in some ways a classic Washington trick, which is we, uh, we wanted to convene really smart thinkers from across the political aisle, people who had served in uh, administrations of both parties, uh, including Trump, Bush, Obama, Clinton, uh, and to really try to work uh, on a kind of a blueprint for the next administration. We started this you know, last year, so the idea was that this was gonna be a blueprint for whoever was president, for whoever was in Congress. And we really wanted to make it about the US government in specifics, because I think obviously the US government is not the only actor on this. There's the United Nations and other countries, uh, you know, other you know, non-governmental actors, but we really wanted our findings directed at the US government because we felt that as we surveyed the landscape of work that had been done in this area, that was something that was really missing. That was a missing piece. So we put together the task force. We, we sought the support of uh, and the partnership really of two other you know, distinguished uh, American institutions. One was the McCain Institute, which is a public policy institute that was founded by Senator McCain and also CSIS, which is a uh, very prominent think tank in which I believe Sarah and Anne and actually Alex have been associated with uh, over the years. And so we're working together with those two other think tanks and with a group of the task force of 15 people and Sarah, I mean, Anne and Sarah's on the task force and, and Alex and Anne are the, uh, are the uh, co-directors and we hope to have a report for, uh, for, for public release in the middle of April. Perfect, let, let me just say for the students, uh, you referenced uh, Eleanor Roosevelt and of course uh, the United States and she in particular were hugely important in the creation of the Universal Declaration for Human Rights and those students who'll be meeting with me on Thursday will have read through it. Um, and then there was really a period of time where the United States was not particularly focused on the issue of promoting democracy and human rights around the world, but it really took off in the 80s, actually under President Reagan, and had a sort of golden moment internationally in the, as the Soviet Union collapsed, the Berlin Wall came down before that, um, the late 80s, early 90s. We went through, of course, after 9-11 and the forever wars, we find ourselves in 2020 rethinking in this task force about how should the US promote democracy overseas and how do we confront, combat, push back, whatever you wanna say on this rising tide of authoritarianism. So just to give the, the listeners a little bit of a, a context, um, let's go to uh, uh, Anne first. Do you wanna add anything on this idea of the task force and how we're coming together in consultations and then I'll go to you, Alex. Sure, first of all, thank you, Sarah. And it's great to be with your students again. I've um, so enjoyed my time talking to your students at CMU previously, and I'm looking forward to hearing your, uh, your the students' questions for us. Um, I just want to say a couple of other points to add to what Mike has already said. Um, first of all, a very Washington point for those of you who may be engaged in various um, roles uh, in, your, in your life other than, than being a student. Uh, we have reached across not only this incredible task force, bipartisan task force of individuals, people like Sarah Mendelson who served as ambassadors and undersecretaries and former assistant secretaries to help us think about this moment across a wide, a wide, a broad toolkit, uh, but that they in turn have reached out to their networks, which are really extraordinary, built over periods of decades to pull in their colleagues, um, the, the individuals whom they rely on, who are their peers to, to help us as well in, in, a, 
in a working in a networked, I would say, uh, working group format. So we're very, very fortunate to have this group pulled together and to put some of our best minds really against this, this problem set. Um, we've been consulting a number of former uh, top officials, uh, former secretaries of state, former national security advisors as well, to help give us a kind of a North Star, particularly in this very divided political moment. So we've been consulting former, those who have served at high levels in a former, former Republican administrations uh, and in, in former Democratic administrations as well. That's a point on the process. And then I just wanted to say one other thing, and I think we'll come back to this a little bit more later in the conversation, and that's the frame. And Sarah, you and I have talked about framing so often previously with your students. The question for us, before us really is, uh, and, what, and what we are thinking about in the context of the, of the task force is, what's the frame? Um, we, we had a, you know, we were Cold War, we were post-Cold War, we were 9-11, and Sarah and I uh, noted we're together on 9-11. What moment are we in now? And how do we, you know, and how do we frame that, which is what we're working on within the task force, um, in the context of backsliding democracy and rising authoritarianism? And then what are the tools that we have uh, really within the U.S. government to address the moment? Uh, given particularly, uh, I would highlight where we are as a country in, uh, in our own democracy and, 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 and challenges to our own democratic institutions and values. Uh, and where are we with our friends and allies who are so important to us as we work together around the world to, to extend and promote um, the way of life that we believe is more peaceful and more prosperous. And I'll leave it there and turn it over to Alex. Perfect, Alex. Hi, everybody. Uh, great to to meet all of you. I, I I think the only thing that I would add, you know, like any uh, great crime, uh, pulling something like this off requires motive, means, and opportunity. Um, and you know, the the motive I think is the first thing that we're really struck by the fact that although uh, for years, in some cases, people on this screen for decades have been working on the challenge of democracy, the importance of human rights, um, and the difficulty of bringing that about uh, both in places like the United States as well as in places that are undergoing transitions. But I think that we noticed something important about this moment uh, that required a sense of urgency. And that was, as Mike articulated in the beginning, that we are now going on 15 years of global backsliding that is affecting countries of every income level, of every sort of democratic level in terms of settled democracies, as well as new ones, and on every continent. Um, and there's something troubling in that when you see after decades of relative progress where you start to see an extended period of decline, I think we're really seized with the idea that A, there's a big problem here and that we might not be seeing the total picture, B, that the things that we have previously done and brought to bear on these environments may no longer be apt, may no longer be sufficient to really meet the challenge that we face today. And so those opportunities, that, that, that motive, that need to rethink is really imperative. Um, but that's never enough because, uh, you know, one of the things that's so important to remember when you're working, whether it's in government or other institutions, even when things are important, it doesn't mean the response, the appropriate response is inevitable. It actually takes people to, it's, it's all just people, right? It's all just people in these organizations and governments in the UN. And it takes people to figure out how to get together and take advantage of, uh, of an opportunity and to bring those means together to actually do so. Now, big things happen that make that more possible. We've seen a big political transition uh, in the United States that may make the people who are controlling the levers of the United States government, which is enormously powerful, actually do something different than the people who were controlling those levers a few days ago. 
but again, that's not a given. Uh, one of the ways in which many of us met was working on the issue of genocide prevention and atrocity prevention. And you step back and you say, okay, that's something that of course everybody wants to do. But the reality was, um, as was well articulated in Samantha Power's book, um, A Problem from Hell and work that that the Genocide Prevention Task Force and the Holocaust Museum did is that even when we see these terrible things and we know it's something that we need to galvanize ourselves and our community to respond to, we still don't do it. And understanding why that is the case and really getting down deep and understanding where the interactions need to happen, what resources need to brought, be brought to bear, what kind of assessments need to be brought in at the highest levels to make sure that you're really paying attention to the problem and that you've actually thought not only about the problem, but what are the real things that are going to be viable solutions to dealing with it. Uh, those of us who've lived in the think tank world love to spend time admiring problems. We're often less good at actually coming up with practical solutions to get things done, uh, which are born from real life experience in difficult environments. Um, and so hopefully we're bringing some of that um, a, in a way that will actually make some people, give people some tools to, to address this in a unique way. Alex, your point about admiring the problem uh, is so apt. I want to point out, though, for folks, if you're interested in how ideas become policy, th the model, I think, is the one that Alex just mentioned, the Genocide Prevention Task Force, which was absolutely bipartisan, had a series of working groups. Alex ran one of them that fed up into a process that ultimately turned into something called the Atrocity Prevention Board, uh, which I was a part of when I was in the Obama administration. Uh, it wasn't perfect, but it was certainly a way of galvanizing the interagency to focus on a set of issues. Um, so before we turn to the crisis and the opportunities that are before us, Mike, let's go first to you talking about why is the United States interested in this from a policy perspective? This is a long history of being actually bipartisan, having a lot of support uh, in Congress for this agenda, certainly overseas. Uh, talking about it at home is a much stickier issue, uh, but generally on the international front, it's been bipartisan. What's the policy argument? Um, and the, the tough question, and we'll come back to this over and over again, how do we do this if we have the kinds of crises that we have currently at home? Mike, over to you. All right. Well, I think, I think the general case for doing this work is that the United States is better off economically, politically, and from a national security point of view, if we are surrounded by more countries that share our values and that are democratically inclined. I mean, obviously, you have to work with every kind of country in the world. And there are times at which cold hearted national security uh, considerations are gonna take precedence. So for instance, you know, there's been a lot of discussion over the last number of years about what our relationship ought to be with Saudi Arabia, uh, which is uh, obviously one of the, according to Freedom House scores, one of the uh, most egregious violators of freedom uh, in the world, and yet we have practical reasons why we have to work with Saudi Arabia. And so that kind of question comes up time and time and again. But I think generally speaking, you know, and we, I think you saw this from really the run of democratization that happened starting in 1945, really up until the fall of the Berlin Wall, which is where uh, there was a, you know, kind of the so-called third wave of democratization in which uh, dozens and dozens of countries became democratic in the wake of World War II. And uh, that growth of democracy, I think, brought with it certain prosperity and security. And I think we're find ourselves at a time now where we have to really kind of make that case again, because it's not so obvious, I think, particularly the American people, I think, who have been quite burdened, if you will, properly so, by the kind of Iraq war and the aftermath and a feeling that democracy promotion uh, really means military intervention and we're not for that, uh, which I really appreciate. I think 
two of the most important kind of qualities of the report we're trying to do is number one is really making the case that this is in our national security interest again to the American people. And then I think number two is to really make it clear to people that you can support democracy without imposing it by force. That is, you know, no one's really down anymore for imposing it by force. And in fact, it tends not to work when you impose it by force. But if you can do things to support democracy activists who are fighting for their own democracy, if you can find ways to, you know, use soft power or sharp power to, to sanction individuals who are uh, uh, egregious violators of human rights or, 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 or corrupt practices, then I think you can make progress. So I think one of the goals here is to really kind of get people to reconceptualize what they think about when we talk about democracy support. Because I do think the word democracy promotion has kind of acquired kind of a, a bad odor in, re in recent years, but I think, you know, it's not. And, 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 and we're America and we have to, you know, be for these values. And not only do we need to be for these values because it's the right thing to do in an idealistic, but it's in our national interest to do so. Part of the problem is that democracies are failing to deliver oftentimes to all of their students, their, all of their citizens um, and their students. Um, we we want to make sure and we, we want to address the fact that particularly since 2008 and the financial crisis, we've, we've seen a particular, um, people are not prospering. Large numbers of people are not prospering. So part of what we're also trying to do in this task force is widen the scope a little bit, as you're suggesting, Mike, of what's the problem set? What are we solving for? Uh, and previously, we'd looked at that, I think, in a, in a much more narrow kind of institution building frame. And we're, we're, we're widening the scope, particularly in thinking about what happens at home. And, and I'll come to that in a second. But before I do, uh, Anne, Alex, do you have anything you want to add in terms of why this is a priority? Why do we do this uh, from a policy perspective? Um, Anne? Right. Uh, so I think Mike made the national security argument very well. And I want to underscore that because as you just said, Sarah, we have previously or um, traditionally over the last number of decades, looked at democracy support from a narrower frame, the traditional pillars of democracy building, fair and free elections, institution building, uh, uh, independent media. And we will talk about those issues again in this report, but by putting the report and the work that we're doing, and more importantly, the work that we'd like the US government to do in a broader frame, we are also uh, going to, I hope, facilitate the, the, the more effective utilization of the other levers that we have. And you're gonna hear about this in, in future lectures or discussions uh, in this series uh, that Sarah is hosting. So uh, anti-corruption, a very, very important piece. Um, trade um, and investment policy, another extremely important piece. And then uh, where we could probably use a lot of help from uh, the generation of students on this, <laughs> uh, in, my, uh, in my Hollywood squares right now, technology, um, which is a new set of newer set of challenges we are confronting. Uh, what are the norms for the use of digital technology? How do we bring uh, the, analog dig uh, the analog human rights norms into the digital world? And how do, we, how do we implement those? And then third, and then not third, but next, um, what do we do about disinformation? Um, we, are, we are working on that as a task force and there are lots and lots of recommendations, a flood of them that have come out uh, over the last few months in particular. Uh, and I think that the work in this area is, is particularly challenging. But the national security frame is really, really important to, to ensure that we take a very broad approach to this moment that we're in. Uh, and, um, and I would say not only because, uh, as Mike indicated, uh, we want, we, 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 
prefer nations who share our democratic values and our way of life uh, as a value proposition uh, because we are less likely to go to war with one another. But also I think in this moment, we really need one another. Uh, we really need to be working together with uh, with our fellow democracies, shore up those who are backsliding and help those are emerging in order to counter the rise of authoritarianism. So there are multiple dimensions to this and, um, and we are going to take a crack at, at taking them on. Alex? Before we go to Alex, Anna, and your point about disinformation is especially well taken in the Heinz and Carnegie Mellon environment. We have a number of colleagues who we're looking at the January 6th events and found that a lot, this is not mainstream media that was driving a lot of this. This, this is in, in doing analysis, data analytics, they're finding that these are, are obscure sources of information that are driving a lot of the action. Um, Alex, over to you, um, why are we doing this? <laughs> Well, you know, I, I want to go for a second, Sarah, to, to first principles, you know, as, as somebody who believes fundamentally in the equality and dignity of every person, I really fundamentally believe that we have to put at the center of the way that we think about the world, the freedom and dignity of people around the world. I have lived uh, in unfree societies. I have worked throughout my career with people who live and struggle in unfree societies in places where people don't enjoy their fundamental rights, either political and civil rights or economic and social rights. Either they are uh, prevented from participating politically, they are tortured, imprisoned, they aren't, don't have freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, but also don't have the right to basic education um, and uh, food uh, and uh, these other things that uh, I think are, are, are absolutely fundamental. Um, and I think it's incumbent on us as a, as a people and a nation and as citizens of both this country and the world to deeply care about those things. And I do think that it, it affects us fundamentally um, in the long run. Um, and so I don't just want to call that the moral argument as though it's not an interest-based argument. I actually believe that, that, that a world in which people enjoy their fundamental rights is in the interests of all of us and in the interests of the United States, which I, I think is also a practical argument because I think that over time we see that those societies which prize the rights of individuals that give uh, attention to equality and that struggle for those things ultimately do the best job of creating the environment, uh, not only that we want to live in, but that where the United States succeeds um, because of innovation and uh, rule of law and effective use of technology and AI of being able to collaborate on things like climate change. These are all things I think that are furthered by societies that are transparent, that are accountable, and where people are given the opportunity to be uh, the best that they can be. And when we live in a world as the one that we now appear to be heading towards, according to Freedom House, where again, a majority of people on the planet are no longer free, um, that, that is unacceptable uh, for us as a country, uh, both in terms of what we represent and, and what our, our best future is gonna look like. Alex, that's an incredibly compelling argument. Um, and it's really important to remind us all of, of first principles. Uh, I see Dan Nagan has an important question I wanna get to. I see uh, Mr. Prasad has his hand up. I wanna encourage you to, to type your question in. Um, before we go to those questions, Mike, let's just take a moment to think a little bit about the crises and the opportunities that we have before us. And how do you weigh those? What are you thinking about? I mean, there's a cottage industry that has evolved in Washington right now. Uh, initially, the argument was, how can you do democracy promotion when clearly our own democracy is not only imperfect, um, we have a long journey to go. Uh, that gets into the policy frame and translated as 
President Biden has committed to doing a summit for democracy, which we'll get into a lot of detail on February 16th. Uh, hint, I'm for it. Um, but there's a lot of people saying, uh, no, we shouldn't be doing that. H how do you weigh the opportunities versus the crisis? Um, how do you think about that at Freedom House? Well, one thing I would say, Sarah, and both you and Alex, I think know this better than I do from having worked for you know considerable stints at USAID. You know, for all the faults that the United States has, you know, our assistance to other countries in the uh, in the democracy space, you know, is not predicated on the idea that like we know best. It's 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 the idea is that there are tools that we have learned over time and i think we can have an argument about how effective those tools are but 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 you know we want you know a lot of our aid is about helping uh democracy activists and human rights activists and others you know help themselves we're not certainly at freedom house you know the strong feeling among my colleagues is you know we're not telling people what to do we are here to try to support you uh, because you know best what to do on the ground in the country where you're fighting for democracy uh, so I think that's just the point that I would make. I think that sometimes democracy promotion are kind of caricatured as something like the U.S. lecturing other people. I do think that that kind of flows a bit from, you know, the Iraq War and the Vietnam War, I guess, to, you know, for those of us who have a longer memory, that, you know, I think those were seen as like, you know, efforts, I think, you know, to impose, you know, you know our own solutions on other countries as opposed to kind of, you know, respecting, you know, how how people, uh, you know, pursue it. I just think I think I think our ability to impose military solutions here is is really very very limited. Uh, the other thing I would say though is that, and I think where your question gets at, Sarah, is that the issue of U.S. democracy is really kind of crucial to this whole venture. I think that if the United States and let me put it this way. I think if the United States democracy is struggling, if it's not healthy, it's not good for the rest of the world. It's not to say that we're not perfect, that we're perfect. It's not to say that, you know, we, you know, our own history has been marred by very serious, you know, uh, really anti-democratic challenges, you know, starting with slavery and going to Jim Crow and ongoing racial inequalities in our country. So I, I, I'm not at all, but I do think that, that the thing about America is, you know, in our founding ideals, it's like a continuing struggle to meet up to those ideals. But I think there's a, there's a, there's a, that's very attractive to people around the world. There's a reason why immigrants want to come to our country and not to Russia or China. So I do believe that the United States has a very strong role to play on this. And we have to repair our own democracy to uh, and, and, be, and be seen as working on that and not just lecturing others. I guess that's just the simplest way that I could put it. And that I think if uh, US democracy is not strong and we are seen as inward looking, that's really not good. And you've seen, look, the reasons for rising authoritarianism are not rooted in the US, right? Russia and China uh, and Turkey have their own internal dynamics that are much more important. But when the United States pulls back and, is, and does not aspire to our ideals, then it's those countries are very much, uh, you know, going to, you know, fill the vacuum in a, in a way that's counter to our interests. So uh, Professor Dan Nagan has a question in the chat that I want to pose to all of us. Can you point to concrete tactics and strategies that have shown to be effective in advancing democracy and human rights? Uh, and I want to take a first cut at it before turning to you guys. Um, Dan, I think the, the real issue has to do with context. Um, one size does not fit all. That we for sure know. And my favorite example is actually Estonia, uh, which was uh, occupied by the Soviet Union for generations. Uh, and after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the government and the people took a lot of very specific uh, strategies and tactics, applied them, we're very much engaged with the US and, and Europeans interested in advancing democracy and human rights and pivoted in a remarkably short period of time. There you have a context where the government and the population 
It's all interested in the same thing. That is the ideal, that is rare. Uh, oftentimes what happens is you've got elites that are interested in capturing part of the state uh, and making themselves rich. And so we may be engaged in excellent work on democracy and human rights on the ground. And here I'm speaking of my own experience in Russia, uh, but there's a kleptocracy that is uh, emerging. Um, and you know there are the cases, and we'll be speaking about this in the weeks to come, to what extent do our institutions in the West enable that behavior, the siphoning off of, of funds? Um, so there's no one answer to concrete tactics and strategies working. I will say that by and large, the more that we're actually listening and responding to uh, the needs of whomever we're working with, the better the work is. That's just a gold standard in development, global development, whether you're working in Pittsburgh or Peru um, or Pakistan. Um, I think it's really about the ability, as Mike was saying, not to come in and lecture, but to be listening and responding. Um, do Alex and Mike wanna come in on the strategies and tactics? I think I have Alex. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to say uh, th three really quick things. Uh, the first is just picking up on, on what you were just saying, Sarah, is that all democracy, all politics is locally owned. Um, and the one iron law of engaging in any of these things is that the interventions, the engagement, the plans for carrying things forward, all of it has to be locally owned. Um, and so I think that we see when it is local institutions, whether it's human rights defenders, civil society organizations, or even uh, government officials who are really uh, uh, key leaders in institutions that are reforming, um, those are the places where the interventions are successful. Um, and it may be an obvious one, but always a, a critical uh, point um, to make. Um, the second one is about practicality. Um, it's great to work, you know, on the big picture of democracy and rule of law and these things. The reality is that that um, programs that I've seen work, uh, a great example, Sarah and I have talked about this, um, that I've seen in recent years is a lot of focus on like things like participatory budgeting. How do you get the government to actually be responsive and accountable to its citizens? How do you get people to be involved in the processes that set policy, that set spending in ways that actually affect their lives so that that translates into something like investment in the local school or in the local roads or in energy, or of course these days in thinking about health systems. Um, those are the ways in which a lot of, of, of whether democracy is functioning, whether government is functioning becomes tangible to people. And the way you make it more democratic is providing avenues for people to actually engage directly in those things. And then you can see practical outcomes. Because one of the hardest things uh, that I think Sarah and I have both spent many years beating our heads against the wall with is that you can invest a lot in democracy, have big programs. There are so many factors that ultimately determine whether a country is moving towards or away from uh, democracy. And the, the programs that USAID and others do can go, can help if, to go with the grain, can move things forward. They are not outcome determinative. They are not going to make an authoritarian country a, a democracy. And so we have to really, really make sure that we can practically understand what the impact of our engagement is um, and be able to measure that as opposed to looking only at the big picture, which can become abstract and difficult to translate investments into, into change. Mike, do you wanna to add to this? We have a lot of really great questions in the chat. I wanna make sure that we have some time to, to address those. No, I, let me just say just very quickly, I'm, I'm very humble about this question of what works and what doesn't. I, mm. I think, candidly, I'm the head of the organization and I'm not completely sure all the time. But I do think, you know, to me, if I could say, I'd be curious what others think. You know, Sudan is kind of an interesting story to me because in the last two years, Sudan has been, it's not a democracy right now, but it is one of the few kind of political openings in the world. 
uh, where this is a country that for 30 years had been run by a very repressive kind of military dictatorship, had been accused of genocide, uh, you know, really, and yet there's been this opening that was really kind of propelled by the people of Sudan themselves, by professionals, doctors, lawyers, and others who were really kind of fed up with the uh, with, with the kind of corruption and the lack of economic performance. It's not just democracies that have to deliver for their people. It's also authoritarian regimes as well, which is kind of the Achilles heel. So to me, Sudan, I'd like to know more about what happened there, but it's interesting that that's a place where there weren't like a lot of AID programs, there weren't like a lot of international investment in democracy building, and yet there was a political opening there that I hope that we will you know, learn some lessons for in the future. Related to this question has to do with how do we know what success looks like? What are the benchmarks? Uh, in some places, it's much easier to tell than others. Uh, I mean, we were speaking about Estonia, but we could speak about Latvia, Lithuania. These are countries that joined the European Union and joined NATO. I mean, one big gold star is there are very specific criteria generally, particularly on the NATO front that you need to go through in order to be able to join uh, including uh, democratic norms, values, rule of law, et cetera. Um, now, it isn't perfect. We've seen backsliding even among EU and NATO countries. That's a whole other challenge. Um, but we think that that is part of the, uh, the recipe. Um, we have a question on disinformation, which I think is particularly interesting for this audience. We'll be returning to it as the main topic uh, in a few weeks. Um, the question is this, what are some of the policy proposals to address disinformation? And do you want to start, since I know you've been spending some time with our colleagues who've been working on this? Yeah, I'd be happy to start. And I just want to, if I may, go back to the previous question and underscore the power of our diplomacy. We've talked a lot about programming. What are the elements of success in programming, local, national level, um, what is successful coming from the United States. But in the context of the example that you raised, Sarah, um, the, the power of our multilateral diplomacy, I think was extremely um, profoundly important uh, at the end of the Cold War um, in uh, helping to, uh, after the breakup of the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union, to orient a number of countries toward the West, um, whether it was about aspirations to joining NATO or the EU, or even being at the table with us in the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe during that very unstable period where countries that um, no longer wanted to be allied with uh, what is now Russia, what was then the Soviet Union, uh, could have a seat next to the United States, next to other large Western powers and be in a dialogue with us that of course was augmented by our bilateral relationships. So I think there are multiple levels that one has to look at uh, when trying to answer this really difficult question as Mike pointed out in a humble way about what works and when and to contextual and, and the context for it as well. Disinformation is a very, um, it's a challenge for us I will say and you'll come back to this in a later you know, in a later session, uh, one of the we we are looking at two different um, large buckets, if you will, to get at disinformation. Uh, one will be, and you'll hear more about this, to uh, find ways to uh, adopt uh, human rights principles uh, for the behaviors of um, of. Uh, in the digital technology world. So whether that's social media platforms of, of any stripe or size or any other way of behavior on the internet. Uh, we were really at the, at the front end of this conceptualization, I would say globally. And, uh, and it's, a, and, and um, anyway, I, 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 think, I think I'm very humble about our ability to, to move ahead on this front, but I also think there's a great imperative there. Uh, so there's a piece that involves governments, there's a piece that involves governments in collaboration <clears throat> with the private sector, and there's probably going to be, there has to be a regulatory piece as well, 
And the big challenge for the regulatory piece right now, as you know, uh, you who are working on this set of issues, anybody who reads the newspaper, and we who have done some very specific interviews on this front know, there's just a huge divide in our own Congress right now uh, uh, around what to do in the regulatory space for social media companies, uh, whether to regulate, how to regulate, start with transparency, uh, start with some other kind of criteria, uh, and uh, so there's that piece. It's like the what to do piece. And then as a friend of mine, who's actually a co Congresswoman on the Hill likes to say, there's a, there's, a, there's a lack of understanding about even what the problems are because as she would say, a lot of people are represented, you know, are elected up there from the flip phone generation. And I would say some of them are from before the flip phone generation. So I'm not going to give you the approaches that we're developing here. I think you should talk about that in a future class. But I will say uh, that we, um, we all have significant challenges in front of us. And in order to get at those challenges, there's going to be, there has to be a fundamental rethink of the way that we all work together across government, between government and the private sector and uh, and with our friends and allies uh, who have shared approaches uh, with us, who may not have shared approaches with us, and some of whom, uh, let's take Estonia, for example, who may be out ahead of us uh, in some ways in understanding what it is that we need to do. Yes, there's an entire Estonian norm that is being developed together with some US tech experts. Um, there's a quick, there's a long question that I want to shorten that really is about rebranding uh, so that our message as we try to promote support democracy in other countries finds a balance between acknowledging where we are, where we want to go and being confident in sharing tools and practices. And I think this gets at the heart of what this Summit for Democracy is. And, and just to telegraph a little bit, and I want to hear from my colleagues, I think the absolute critical issue is listening tours. I think we need town halls. We need consultations domestically. I think you see in the Biden administration an interest in having these issues elevated by having Ambassador Rice as the head of the Domestic Policy Council. And we have somebody as the National Security Advisor who has spent a considerable amount of the last number of years looking at middle-class America and what the foreign policy for our middle-class America looks like. And so I think you're gonna be seeing really almost for the first time a conversation between democracy at home, democracy abroad, and, and binding them together. Uh, so to the extent that we can do that here and encourage our allies to do the same, because we're not the only democracy that is going through this. We have lots of colleagues, allies, uh, that are also experiencing these issues. And when you look at disaggregated data, you see the inequality, you see the inequities in many societies that we may label so-called developed countries, uh, but in fact, there are huge uh, disproportion uh, stratification in these, in these countries that need to be addressed. So that's my quick take, um, but I wanna see if uh, Mike or Alex have anything to add. I'm conscious we have five minutes and lots of really great questions. We're capturing your questions. And in fact, Alex has gone ahead and answered uh, one in the chat function. My apologies ahead of time if we do not get to everybody's. Uh, we are capturing them and I'm sure we're gonna return to them. But Mike, go ahead, over to you. Uh, I have to hop off actually in a, in a couple of minutes. So I'm a little bit unclear what you, if there's a final point. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan of this idea of the Summit for Democracy. I know there's been some, you know, uh, pushback against that idea from people who say, well, you know, America's gotta, you know, get its house in order first before they do this. And like, geez, these problems have been with us for years, you know, political polarization, racial inequality, uh, you know, a dysfunctional media ecosystem, uh, you know, huge influence of, of, of money and politics. They're just profound challenges uh, to American democracy. So I don't think we're gonna somehow solve those problems in the next six months and then be ready to go overseas and, and, and work on, you know, global democracy. I think. I think we have to work uh, in tandem on these issues. We have to walk and chew gum. And I think I liked what Sarah said, is that we have to kind of look at this from the point of view that we are in solidarity with other democracies. We are not, you know, we, we don't come to this from a point of view of, uh, of, of superiority. 
or be, we come to, 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 to this from a point of view of, of humility, that you know, we all have something to learn from each other and we all can dedicate ourselves to making our own democracies better. And we all have something to say to help the other guy or gal, you know, depending on uh, the situation in terms of you know, improving democracy. So I, I'm very much a fan of the summit and I would be, it would be terrible, I think, if the administration you know, pulled back from that idea, which I don't think they will. Oh, I'm gonna, Sarah, I have to jump off for sure. another call. It starts certainly, but I really enjoyed it. Thank you all. Thank you, Mike. Alex, conscious we have three minutes. I mean, I think the, the last thought that I would leave people with is to think of this not as a moment in time, but as a, as a broader arc. Uh, Anne made this point before that we don't know what era we are in, and that's probably going to be true for some time. Um, the best ones probably don't get named as they're happening immediately uh, because there's all kinds of factors that we're trying to understand. Um, but that also means in a way that the, that the cement is wet, um, and it is a moment in which um, relations and codes and standards for technology um, and rethinking the blind uh, you know, obeisance to globalization and all of the good it brings, which maybe it doesn't only bring good. All of these things are in flux at the moment. And so we have to be about thinking about a democratic project, both for the United States and our relationships that I think rethinks about that our basic beliefs in equality and the world that we think that we are going to survive in and thrive in with all of the other challenges of climate change and global health security and use that as our guide to think about, okay, so if these are the things that are important to us, what is, how do we use the, the, the tools that we have to bring and the policies that we have to set to, to, to put that on course in the long run and I think that it comes to, we then come to a really important question about whether we are going to pull the belief in democracy and rights across that and use that as a guide or whether we're going to go down a, a rabbit hole of, of thinking much more narrowly about national interests that are likely to embolden those other forces. Yeah, not to be too apocalyptic with one minute left, but uh, this is uh, along with climate change, I would argue the big existential questions of our time. Uh, we, we don't have many too, too many bites at the apple to get this right, uh, but it's absolutely critical. If you are a Heinz student and you wanna know more about this, it's still, you still have time to register for the class. You join me uh, in a session on Thursday for a deep dive. Uh, and we'd appreciate your reflections on what you heard today by the end of the day, just a couple sentences. My apologies if we didn't get to your question and there's a really excellent one by Siraj Prasad on whose democracy is it? And I hope that we can take that up uh, at our next session where we're gonna be joined by David Kramer uh, and um, uh, Nicole Sid uh, Bibin Sadaka from Georgetown University. Uh, uh, David, former assistant secretary who's coming to us from Florida uh, International University. Um, so uh, join me uh, and my colleagues. Thank you so much. We'll see you next Tuesday with David and Nicole, where we'll dig deeper into your questions uh, and, and discussions. So thank you so much. Uh, be well, be safe. Bye-bye.